Thank you for being um, here with us today, everyone. Uh, this is the fourth of our Grand Challenge sessions titled Strengthening a Unified Human Rights Voice on the Rohingya Crisis. We like to begin all of the Grand Challenges by remembering the many millions of people that we have gathered here on behalf of, several of who are not permitted to travel here to be with us. So may I please ask you to set aside your phones and connect your hearts and mind with not just the complex issues of statelessness, but the people of statelessness. We read you the words of Mayu Ali. The river separates Arakan and Bengal, the river that Rohingya started to hear. The crossing is to escape or to die, where many are swallowed alive. East becomes a roaring inferno. West is the world's largest makeshift camp. Some leave their limbs behind. Bodies are carried. Other cross with bullets embedded. A bullet in the chest bigger than a heart. A body falls into the water. Another dances on the riverbank. The world just watches on. Whilst criminals erase their marks, the river cradles irrefutable evidence. Whilst human solidarity is a lie, waves bear witness what the victims suffer. Thank you. Thank you, Ashling. Um, a couple of announcements before I set the stage for this incredibly important topic. The first is please use social media, tweet, Instagram about ISI and, and specifically this panel. Secondly, there's been a switch in the sessions. If you can see up here, the 4.30 is now at 2.30 and vice versa and apologies for that. The events that transpired in Rakhine State, Western Myanmar on August 25th, 2017, were the culmination of decades of methodical, systematic planning on the part of the Burmese government to dehumanize and ultimately eradicate the Rohingya people. This genocide, which drove over 720,000 people over the border to neighboring Bangladesh to join the hundreds of thousands of Rohingya people who had fled from previous outbreaks of violence was a carefully constructed campaign made possible through the removal of the basic human rights that we're all entitled to, including the loss of Burmese citizenship. And now, this stateless population lives in purgatory and appalling conditions in camps in Bangladesh without freedom of movement and access to formal education. The Burmese government, having faced few if any consequences for the egregious crimes it has committed, continues to be emboldened to violate the rights of its citizens in Rakhine State. On June 21st, the Ministry of Transport and Communications ordered that all mobile providers cut data to nine townships in Rakhine and Chin states, blaming internet access for causing disturbances to the peace. This move ensures that over one million people effectively have no access to the outside world. All of this, of course, occurring in the midst of an ongoing conflict between the military and rebel factions that have displaced at least 35,000 people in Rakhine State. For the tens of thousands of people who have been forced into displacement camps, including ethnic Rakhine, there remains little opportunity for access to livelihoods and education and no freedom of movement. Moreover, the government has restricted access to outside agencies, including the UN, who were providing life-saving support. On June 16th, the resident coordinator for the UN in Myanmar shared a letter to Myanmar's Minister of Social Welfare, Relief, and Settlement announcing that the UN would not be able to provide beyond life-saving assistance to residents of these IDP camps due to the Burmese government's ongoing policy of apartheid against the Rohingya. This announcement comes on the heels of increasing evidence that the government intends to build permanent structures in these camps, further solidifying its commitment to strip, strip its citizens of any remaining human rights and dignity. This conference comes at a critical time as the situation in Rakhine State further deteriorates and it becomes all the more apparent that the government of Myanmar has no intention of creating the conditions that are imperative to allowing for repatriation of the very people whom they have rendered stateless. I am honored to be joined by this incredible group of people who will reflect on what's happened to the Rohingya people of Myanmar and discuss what can and should come next to ensure the full restoration of their rights. This is a very different panel in that we have eight amazing panelists. 
They're each going to speak in pairs of two for 15 minutes. And we'll start with the Ambassador Sheikh Mohammed Bilal, Ambassador of Bangladesh to the Netherlands, who will be speaking with Letitia Vendana, some diplomatic expert. And they're going to speak about the international responses to the Rohingya crisis, its opportunities and pitfalls. Thank you. If I may, may start with just a few introductory words to make sure that we all are reading from the same page as far as the context is concerned. First, quickly, the numbers we're talking about. You hear a lot about the numbers in Bangladesh. There are, you know, over successive waves of expulsion have led to over one million Rohingya in Bangladesh. That's certainly the largest group of any country in the world. Then you have anything between um, 280,000 and 400,000 remaining in Myanmar itself. So that is not a very large group. Plus, and this is the third group that's very important and it's rarely ever discussed, there are close or perhaps even more than one million Rohingya in other countries. The biggest group, about half a million, is in Saudi Arabia. You have about 200,000 in Pakistan. You have 150,000 in um, in, in Malaysia, you have India, and uh, it's important to know that because when we talk about solutions for for the Rohingya crisis, as it's often called, the, these these this biggest group is not included. Um, second point: international engagement, um, because uh, um, Bangladesh. Uh, has welcomed more than one million people on its ter territory. That is, I think, the most important player in attempts to find solutions, but it cannot do it alone. Unfortunately, we've seen that uh, various uh, other countries and various uh, international fora have not been uh, forthcoming in trying to help help the different uh, gov governments together with the Rohingya find solutions. The obvious problem is the UN Security Council, which has not acted uh, because of the positions of China and Russia that block any meaningful um, discussion about where this, uh, w how, the, how the situation could be solved. Um, there is, though, and that's the positive side of the UN, whenever this is discussed in the UN General Assembly or the Human Rights Council in Geneva, there is massive support for solutions, and, and these are being brought to the table. But, you know, m meaningful solutions uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, efforts at peacekeeping or greater engagement by the UN, by the UN would require Secur Security Council um, approval. There is a growing emphasis on regional solutions, and a big player is ASEAN, the, the, um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations which just this weekend um, agreed at a, in Bangkok at a, a summit at the level of head of state and government to uh, move ahead with its plans to cooperate closely with um, the government of Myanmar to help it. Help is, I think, a bit euphemistically worded. <laughs> to solve uh, the problem and to help the return of all of those who are in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, the conditions that, um, that, that uh, are part of this collaboration between ASEAN and, um, and Myanmar don't give us much hope that, that much will come out of that. Another important player is the ICRC. The ICRC is, together with a few other organizations, the only agency that Aung San Suu Kyi's government has allowed to operate in in um, the closed-off areas of northern and central Rakhine State. But, you know, much as I think we all think very highly of the ICRC, the ICRC wasn't chosen just because it's a, it's a nice organization. It was chosen because it does not speak about what it finds. So the choice of ICRC means that the knowledge gap that we have about what is happening has even um, widened. Um, I will not talk about the, 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 um, the, the engagement of international uh, courts, because uh, another pair will do that. Um, but basically, the, the key 
apart from the regional organizations, all of the others, and that includes uh, Europe, that includes the US, that includes um, many other countries, are very focused on providing humanitarian assistance, but are not really engaged in helping to try um, to find solutions for the longer term. Now, last point, the reality in Myanmar. There is a Rohingya crisis, it's often spoken about. Um, it's, and it's obvious that of all the different people, peoples in Rakhine State, they have borne the brunt of the marginalization and, um, and, and the brutal repression. But the Rohingya crisis is part of a bigger one, the Rakhine crisis. Uh, a state, the poorest state of, of Myanmar, where successive governments... Are we already that far? Well, then I'll skip this, but I think it's essential, but maybe I can help bringing it out in, in the discussion. But, Ambassador, I've, I've, I think I was correct in saying that Bangladesh is a, not a key player, but the key player in, in, in um, trying to find a solution. And I think the, the world owes your country and your government and your people a debt for uh, what they have done in order to house this enormously big group of um, Rohingya from, from Myanmar. What at present, um, you know, how, with everything I've sketched uh, in relation also to how the international community has been responding to the crisis, how do, do you view the situation at the moment? Where do you, would you find solutions? Where, would, where should we look? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish uh, somehow I know the place where you can go and get the key, master key, and have the solutions. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion for organizing this hugely important conference on statelessness and also giving us a uh, space to speak. Yeah, on the role of Bangladesh and as whether or not we are a key player or not, you know, there is a saying in diplomacy that uh, we, everyone is trying to do something nowadays in a smart way. So if you call a smart diplomacy, it should be something where you l leave others to say what you need to say. But in our case, I think we became so desperate, we are not that diplomatic. We have been trying all we could, bilaterally, multilaterally, or if there is any other lateral ways, vertical or horizontal, to have a solution of this problem. Because we have seen in our own history the pain of genocide and atrocity crimes so memories of those kind of pains is almost vivid. And this is perhaps one of the inspiration why our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, whom the world came to be termed as mother of the humanity, I think opened our border and the whole nation stood behind her. So coming back to your main questions, where we can find the solutions, I think the solution is very simple. You have to treat a human being like a human being. And if you don't treat a human being like it is, there has to be consequences. You have to help those people who are not treating those people accountable. So if we, the international community, simply get united together and tell them, tell the government of Myanmar that enough is enough. Time has come for you to accept that you really put these people in a condition where your own people calling them as cockroaches, termites, pests, but they are human beings. So their dignity as a human being has to be upheld by any means. And it is the role of the international community to hold accountable all the perpetrators, even at the at the level of uh, their villages and community who are breaking these norms and rules. And number two, we have to go back to the root causes of these pollutions. The Rohingya people all this time, they are uh, almost stateless in their own country. Why? 
they are not like what they are now. I come from a part of Bangladesh, Chittagong, and I, sp I almost share the same ethnicity with you. And I speak her language as well. So when I grew up, I, I see that my fathers and my grandfathers, they used to boast at that time that for their wedding shoppings and other, they used to go to Arakan. But the same Arakan now became a, a, a piece of escorted art. But the world remained silent. The only way to have a solution for you, all the nice people who, who came all the way here to join this uh, forum, please speak up. Raise your voice. Get united and say that enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That's uh, bread shooting up international pressure is certainly something that is very uh, uh, much needed. Um, in the meantime, however, um, Bangladesh has over one million, um, over one million uh, Rohingyas on its on its territory. How do, does it look at the immediate future? What would the international community be able to do to assist Bangladesh even further in bearing this burden and to make sure that the the Rohingya who are the, who are with you can further improve their lives? and their, their, their prospects, and I'm particularly talking about the, I think, 400 and, over 450,000 within the group who are actually ch children and young people. Thank you. Uh, before I proceed further, I think I should also pay my regards and tributes to you, Ambassador Leticia. I think you have been one of the people in this whole global art who has been a huge blessings to these persecuted people. And I thank you for that. And in terms of what the international community could do for their repatriations, and it's first to make sure that they can go back to their own place of about their home with <coughs> dignity, safety, security, and as a human being and you have to ensure their safety. With all our efforts, as I said, that we have been remain engaged with them. We have signed, I think, almost uh, quite a few documents with the Myanmar. We haven't been able to repatriate one single Rohingya people up till now. And there is a statistic that if we start repatriating today, if you send 300 people per day, it will take 12 years to send back the people that we have now. So you can see the enormity of this problem. And for this reason, I would like to propose or something that we have been saying in the international community, what the international community could do. First, I think they should address the accountability issues. Myanmar's own investigation process has failed to prove its impartiality and credibility time and again. Therefore, the existing UN mechanisms, namely ongoing independent mechanisms, independent international fact-finding missions, should be allowed to operate and cooperate with for addressing the total impunity for the decades of crimes committed in Myanmar. Second, ensure full implementation of the memorandum of understanding between the Myanmar government, UNDP, and UNHCR, as well as of the recommendations of the Kofi Annan's advisory commissions on the Rakhine State, to whom you, will, you are also a member of that commission. We have been hearing that most of the recommendations of Annan commissions, in fact, this is the question I am going to ask, so I'm just giving you a hint, <laughs> that Annan commission have already been implemented. It is then very natural for one to ask why Rohingyas are not willing to return voluntarily, why we are still having fresh arrivals. So I think for that, I think time has come for the world to get united to, for the idea of creating a civilian-run safe zones in conflict-affected areas in Myanmar in order to ensure safety and security of all civilians, irrespective of their ethnic or religious identity. As proposed by our Honorable Prime Minister during the 72nd 
United General Assembly, and then repeated again in the 73rd uh, UN, General, UN General Assembly. That safe zones may be non-military and civilian in nature, administered by humanitarian and human rights actors, including from ASEAN. S second, please implement the recommendations of the Anand Commission as well as provide all necessary assistance to the International Criminal Court and the likes with due earnest in the spirit of bringing an end to the culture of impunity. And the third should be for the Security Council has to negotiate a draft resolution to set out a regular reporting cycle as an oversight mechanism on the implementation of the recommendations of the Advisory Commission. Progress of investigations of human rights violations and taking a stock of accountability metrics with visible signs of progress. I think these few things, like safe zones and also implementations of this Anand Commission's recommendations and other documents, and Security Council has to have a mechanism so that they can regularly do a stock taking, otherwise held accountable who are failing in the process. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those suggestions. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that we'll be able to get back to those uh, after other speakers have spoken, because I, th I think they're quite important and they, they do deserve attention. I would just like to flag one more uh, that I think could also be part of the discussion, and that is a question to you and your government whether, now that we know that you know soon the Rohingya will be have, have been there for two years, whether your government would consider um, allowing a formal education to be provided to the over 450,000 of them who are there who are children and, and young people. I, I don't think we should answer that now, but we could leave that open for the discussion later. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ambassador and Leticia. That was very helpful. The next pair, Hafsar Tamisudan and Amal De Shikira. Uh, Hafsar is a Rohingya activist, and Amal, we all know, co-founder and co-director of ISI, are going to speak about the statelessness and the right to nationality of the Rohingya people. Thank you all for having me here today. It's a true honor to me to be here today with all of you, the amazing people with me. And it's a true honor for me to be able to be here today to represent, to be the voice of our people here today. The reason why I chose to be the activist, which I have never dreamed of when I was young, because in 2012, when this very huge mass massacre against Rohingya has been happening, something inside me is telling me that you gotta do something about it. When a part of your body gets injured, the entire body feels the pain. That's the reason why I try to do whatever little things I can do by the thoughts of what if my participation matters? What if my voice matters? That's how I get involved into these things. And also I believe that things are not getting worse for the people who create and do evil things. And also because of the people who witness and see this and know that it is not right and still choose not to do anything about it. So I choose not to be one of them. Yes, statelessness has caused us so much of deprivation and making us vulnerable in so many ways and a lot of impacts on our lives and making us incapable of defending ourselves. We were not born to be vulnerable, we were made to be vulnerable. That's what I understand. And is there anything that you want to continue Thank asking you. me the question? Yeah. Thank you so much, Hafsa. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the impact of statelessness on the Rohingya in Myanmar is I mean, we don't need to speak about that, it's evident, and I mean, everyone in this room understands that. But I just want to, to broaden that out a bit and talk about the impact of statelessness and the impact of the imposed lack of a legal identity on Rohingya also in other countries in the world. And I've seen this firsthand, for example, when I spoke to an elderly, elderly Rohingya man in 2008 in Bangladesh who was denied the right to bury his son who had died or in Malaysia, where Rohingya refugees, unprotected, are subject to detention and trafficking. Uh, Rohingya children in many countries who are denied the basic right to acquire a nationality, which we see reflected in Article 7 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So the impact of statelessness on the Rohingya is long-standing, and it is widespread. And I think it is also perhaps one of the reasons why 
we are having this premature discussion about repatriation of the Rohingya. I can't think of any other situation in world history where when the wounds are so fresh, when the persecution is ongoing, when the scale is so significant that the priority of the international community seems to be on repatriation over protection of rights, protection of the right to nationality, safety, etc. But I'm sure these are questions that we will all come back to as well. My question to you, Hafsa, is on the label of statelessness that the Rohingya face, because under international law, by definition, Rohingya are stateless. But I know that many Rohingya reject the term because it is seen as a denial of your belonging to Myanmar. And I would like to ask you to share with us your thoughts on how you feel when you are labeled as stateless by the international community. Thank you for your question. To be honest with you, that is not the label we choose to have. That is the label we were forced to have. A lot of us don't want to accept it because it is not right. We all know that that is the land where our ancestors have lived, served, and fought for. We all know in the, our essence that this is our right to be the citizen of the country. No matter where they recognize us, they don't recognize us. We are still, and we will still be. The land of the, uh, the people of the land. I think that's the reason why some of us are still denying that we are not stateless. But even if we deny, we are having the negative impacts of being put under this level every single day of our life. And I still remember how I grew up as a stateless person and having a lot of question mark in my head. Why do I and other people are getting treated in this way? different than other people in the classroom, in the street, and everywhere we go. Why do we even get called by the name that doesn't belong to us? So there are so many things that has affect us, and the reason why we are still having difficulty of accepting the title and the level of statelessness because we are not one. Thank you so much, Hafsa. And if I may share my, my personal reflection with, with you on this, this is, this is an issue that I've, I've personally grappled with for over 10 years that I've been working on the Rohingya issue. Uh, how I, as an advocate operating in the international law space, how do I reconcile the fact that the Rohingya are legally stateless and that therefore is an important advocacy message because we are fighting for their right to a nationality? with the notion and the belief amongst Rohingya, like Ne Salvin and Hafsa and Tunkin and many others, uh, that this term is imposed on them and it is being used to undermine their connection and their, 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 their claim on Burmese citizenship. And what I've, what I've kind of, where my thinking has led me is that it's important to recognize that statelessness is an imposed condition which is an arbitrary deprivation of the right to nationality. So in other words, the Rohingya are not stateless because in any way they have less of a connection to Myanmar. They are stateless because Myanmar has acted and is continuing to act unlawfully. But I think we cannot stop there. I think the reason the Rohingya are quite frankly quite fed up and uh, have lost trust and faith in us collectively as an international community is because we've rightly enhanced the position that Rohingya are stateless. But where we have failed is to stand with them when they identify themselves as Rohingya, when they identify themselves as Burmese. So you would see over the years, over the decades, international documents which refer to the Rohingya as stateless but don't refer to them as Rohingya refer to them as Muslims of Arakan state or in any other strange construction to kind of allude to their identity. And this is as ridiculous as if I was to wrongly tell Aung San Suu Kyi that she's not Burmese, she's Thai. And she would say, no, I'm not Thai, I'm Burmese. And then I would say as a solution, it's, it's wrong to call you Thai, but it's also wrong to call you Burmese. So let's call you a Buddhist who lives in Myanmar. It's the same thing, and we are complicit in that. Uh, so we need to get beyond this. We need to recognize the Rohingya's right to a nationality 
and push for that because the Rohingya belong in Myanmar and that's where they're from. And this leads me to my final question to you, Hafsa, which is we've seen very strongly in every, almost every response I've heard from the Rohingya community since 2017, but also since the early 2000s and even before, that first and foremost, or in the top three of their list of demands, of your list of demands, is being recognized as citizens, the right to a nationality. So I think where we can end our discussion and pass on to the next uh, is how important is the right to a nationality for the Rohingya as a condition for return? Thank you for your question. I will say this is the most important thing to us. If we look into all the problems that have been happening in the past, right now, what are the situation ongoing in Bangladesh, everything, the root cause is the denial of citizenship. So therefore, it is very important for us if we are going back to our home, the place where we belong to, the most important thing is to be recognized as the citizen, not something else. The things that the Burmese government and some organization has been recommending us to accept another level of, I don't know, it's the first step of citizenship, the so-called NBC. To me and to us, it makes us feel like they are not respecting us as the human. We are not asking for something that doesn't belong to us. We are requesting to give us what is ours since the beginning, since a long time ago. And I have met a lady in Malaysia who has survived the massacre in 1978 and who had fled to Bangladesh and seek refuge in 1980s. And there was a time that the repatriation happened with the agreement with the Bangladesh government, international communities, and the Burmese government saying that now you can go home. We ensure your safety. And she went back even though she didn't want to because there were no other option. And she was telling us that not before long ago we went back. We faced the same thing again. And there were no one who helped and come and save us. We witnessed again being killed, our loved ones in front of our eyes. We just watched them die. We couldn't do anything. So what we do we just run back to Bangladesh again and became refugee for the next generation again. And she is still in Malaysia. She is not the only one that I met and spoke to. So what did it say? It said that we need to make sure that if we go home at this time, we need to go home under full protection and insurance. And we are not making international communities and organizations and diplomats difficult by not agreeing to accept NBC and repatriation. We are requesting to make sure, to ensure our safety and protection before we go home. We all want to go home. We can be anywhere around the world for the unavoidable situation. I am in New Zealand now, but the essence of me, I am Rohingya. That is where I belong to. That is our home. So if we are going home this time, I think the people from Bangladesh, the people from around the world, no matter where we are strandering, like the people who belong to nowhere, we are requesting the world, we are requesting the international communities and everybody to make sure this time we go home with dignity. We are very much looking forward to the day where our dignity will be restored, where we will be able to go home and reunite with our loved ones because the statelessness had separated us from our loved ones for eternity. The moment you escape from the land, there is no guarantee that you will see them back. So there are so many things that I've gone through that I cannot emerge into express with words. So in honor of the people who are still stuck in Burma, in the refugee camps inside their own countries, in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, and the people who are just holding up into the hope that one day we'll be able to go home. And I am requesting everyone to make sure this time we go home with our full protection dignity and our full citizenship. Thank you, Hafsa. Thanks so much, Hafsa and Amal. Um, our third pair is John Packer and Toon Kin. John has a very impressive and lengthy title. He is the director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center 
and Neuberger Justin, Professor of International Conflict Resolution in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. And Tun Kin is a Rohingya activist and president of the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK. And they will speak about justice and accountability for genocide and crimes against humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I have a pretty simple question for you, uh, Tin Kun. Uh, for you and for the Rohingya, what is justice? What would be justice? Uh, first of all, I would like to express many thanks, uh, you know, organizers of this conference, and, and it's a great honor to be here, and thank you to all of my friends, you know, joining at this event. Um, thank you, John, for your question. Um, I'm a Rohingya. I was born and brought up in Arkana State, western part of Burma. I left when I was about 17 years. Uh, my grandfather was a member of parliament, and my mother's grandfather was the first judge in northern Arkan, but I was not recognized as a citizen of Burma. I'm a lucky one to, able, to be able to leave from the country, and uh, currently I'm working in our, in the, for the cause. And, you know, uh, when 2017 crisis happened, I visited um, to the camps, actually, many times. But the, uh, I was there on, when about um, September first week. I met many, big, uh, many genocide survivors. They fleeing, crossing the border. And I spent a month, uh, interviewed many genocide survivors. And I heard one thing unite them. When I heard from them is, Brother, we want justice, and we want justice, and we want to go back to our homeland. That is what I heard from them. So, what does justice mean for them? Uh, for example, uh, one a lady told me from you know Rathidown Township. She was raped by military in front of her husband when her husband was trying to protect her, he was slaughtered by the military. And her daughter, two years, was thrown to the fire where the next to the house was burning. And she was raped, and second time another military tried to rape her, and she struggled, and she was finally managed to leave without her husband and her daughter. And she joined with the villagers, and she came to Bangladesh. There is many similar stories I heard, like her story, you know. Like, so the point is, justice main to them is when they talk to me. They want to see first thing, military criminals who, you know, committed these crimes and genocide against our people want to see, bring them to the justice, first thing. And secondly, they want to return their homeland with full citizenship rights, with dignity and protection. And also they want to get compensation and they want to return to their own original place. They want to see compensation, they want to get what they have suffered. And thirdly, you know, the victims, the survivors in the camps, they want to get recognition. We have seen UN report in last September 2000, uh, you know, 2019. We have seen uh, 2018 of uh, September, there was a report, UN fact finding mentioned what's happening to Rohingyas are genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So th when we are facing a genocide in 21st century, we have not seen any, the governments are not recognizing what's happened to us, to the genocide survivors, including myself. And they want to, the governments, particularly Canadian parliament, we have seen they recognize what happened to Rohingya as a genocide. And the governments are still, U.S. government, you know, we have not seen anything. Even U.S. law firm have mentioned what's happened to Rohingya as a genocide, which was hired by a State Department and U.K. and other European countries. No recognition at all. What's happened to our, our brothers and sisters 
who have been massacred, many reports, 10,000, 15,000, according to one Canadian report, 24,000 Rohingya has been killed. So what more we expect, you know, from this government? So it is very important that recognition is very important. We can see only one thing. Bangladesh government have given us a shelter, protection, while we are risking for our lives in Bangladesh, uh, from Burma, you know. That is what we have only seen. So that is what the justice main they told me when I visited to the camps. Thank you very much. Um, what kind of steps, uh, in, in terms of next steps, do you think, uh, uh, or appeals for justice, would you like to make? I think especially uh, that is very important when we talk about justice, so what actions and can be taken. And uh, for me, actually, Rather, I will ask from you about that question because you are a lawyer and you know you know about uh, the laws and others who are international laws and how they operate in. You know, uh, we have seen actually on that case recently UN release uh, UN Secretary General mentioned UN UN system been failed and Security Council China Russia been blocked. It's totally deadlocked. So. What are the real possibilities for these genocide survivors who are stuck in, in Bangladesh, one million people? This is what's happening in the 21st century. So how long we need to wait? Two years anniversary is approaching in two months. So what are the real possibilities you can, uh, you can see as a lawyer? Well, <laughs> there's probably several people here who can comment uh, uh, or supplement, but um, conceptually, of course, the real justice would be a kind of combination of the things that, uh, that the people you've interviewed and yourself have been asking for, but the essence of justice is often, from one perspective, contained in the idea of restitution, to, to have a restore of uh, the situation before the harms, to return to your, uh, let me say, original position on your land, with your community, with your families, your social network, um, your forms of organization, your faith, uh, your dignity. Uh, so that implies a lot of things. Um, we sometimes think of this in uh, in the domestic sphere in kind of material terms. If someone takes something from you, they must give it back. Uh, but of course what you have suffered, and when we're talking about genocide, perfect restitution is not possible. Uh, the people who had lives taken, uh, indignities uh, perpetrated upon them, there is no perfect restitution, not even a modest restitution. Um, some things can be restituted, uh, material things. You said that the, the second thing people asked for is to go to your homeland. I think that's what you want, too. Yes. And uh, we heard that also earlier. Um, so that raises the question of how to do that. It's possible to do that. It's within the Your homeland exists. Damage has been done. Villages burned, but the land exists. Um, and the villages can be rebuilt, so they can be restored in that sense. Um, and other el elements of material loss can be compensated for. Animals destroyed, personal belongings. There can also be compensation, I mean material compensation for degrees of suffering. And there can be moral satisfaction. I think you mentioned recognition. That would be quite, I think, important. If I were wronged, I would want it to be observed, acknowledged that the wrong has been done. And maybe the recognition of who I am. I not only was wrong, but I exist. It's kind of a double wrong. And of course, there is the idea that the wrongdoers, the perpetrators, 
must be identified and must be brought to justice. I think that was a phrase you said, to bring to justice. Now, let me just add a couple things in that regard. Unfortunately, I have to say, contemporary international law is pretty weak on all of this. And the um, opportunities are few. Um, and specifically, while we may have standards, we can talk about genocide. There is a genocide convention. There is a statute that prohibits of Rome that statutes that uh, prohibits various acts. But we're pretty weak on the mechanisms. We're pretty weak on the institutions to pursue them. Not very accessible for you as a victim. So you need others to step up and act for you. And in this regard, it may seem a bit absurd, but the very governments who you just said are not recognizing the wrong are also the ones that need to act, uh, not just in recognition. Under the Genocide Convention, none of us sitting here can bring a case. Neither can you, nor the victims you interviewed. This is a matter of states. And the obligation is on states. And the wrongs, some of the wrongs you talked about, and the wrongs we just heard about, about nationality, no individual did it. No individual adopted the Act of National uh, Citizenship of 1982, and no individual can repair it. That's an act of state, and it needs a state to repair it. Now, the only little good news on this is that, at least for genocide, we have pretty clear law internationally, and we have a pretty clear mechanism, which is about 200 meters from here or maybe 300 meters from here, called the International Court of Justice. And we have 151 states now. Uh, just last month, Dominica became the 151st state party to the Genocide Convention. That's three quarters of the states of the world have accepted this, including Myanmar and Bangladesh and the Netherlands and Canada, if I can associate myself with Canada. Um, and I mention Canada because you mentioned Canada. Canada has recognized as a genocide, as has uh, Bangladesh. Your president has mentioned this several times. So I think the, it really begs the question, why not act? Uh, and the re recourse is there, and the opportunity to seek justice, both in terms of the Genocide Convention, its full name is a convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. And it has specific obligations which would treat all these elements of justice, of repair, of recognition, and of accountability. The last thing I will say is that there is another court in this town, the International Criminal Court, and it does have a procedure underway, and the prosecutor mentioned just the other day an initiative uh, to investigate uh, certain individuals for crimes. But I have to say that's limited and the chance is small. Uh, if you ask me professionally, the opportunity is limited, the chance is small, and it will not lead to the kind of repair that we're talking about. Thank you, Professor John Pecker. Um, I have another question as, uh, Should we as keep you it are... For the next? I think yeah. we have to wait for the next... I think we're going to go to the next group and then maybe at the end we can... We still have five minutes, questions. I thought. Three minutes. Three yeah. minutes. Okay. Yeah, we have to take, take your that. Three minutes. So <laughs> we can't. Two and a half. And we have seen that, you know. Take the three minutes. <laughs> yes, uh, it's important. <laughs> uh, UN, ACR, UNDP, and Burmese government have signed an MOU, you know, and there is no consultation with the Rohingyas who are the main victims, and. We have seen, you know, ASEAN recently, the AHA, they released a report without consultation of the Rohingya. They just simply say Rohingya can be able to return back, where our Rohingya brothers and sisters suffer in situate camps more than seven years, and there is genocide is still ongoing. That's how they mention, without any. And, you know, as Rohingya, we have our own culture and our civilization. We have our grandfathers and many Rohingyas, uh, you know, 
Rohingyas, our grandfathers have been MPs, and we've been particip uh, participated in Burma in, you know, in a government parliaments and teachers and other government services. We had a power, you know, during democratic period time until 1978. Rohingya have been quite well recognition we had in Burma, you know. This is the stateless is one of the instrumental issues that 1982 citizenship law denied our citizenship rights. And this is one of the instrumental of genocide against Rohingya to destroy us. So uh, we are a part of Burmese society. We've been contributed many times, you know, even, uh, you know, before, uh, you know, independence during British colonial time, Rohingya been uh, you know, contributed for the country, for the independence too, you know. So, why are we pets? They are not, you know, in, uh, uh, they are not uh, excluded from discussion from our own fate. This is really disappointing as a genocide survivor myself and other Rohingyas. So, how can we change it? Do you have any idea? Thank you. Okay, I don't think I have time to answer that, but uh, let me first of all say, I, I, I'm very glad that you uh, made that intervention and, and expressed part, part of recognition and as human beings is, uh, no, you're not pets, you're not, you are human beings. And, and, uh, and you just expressed human beings with not only your own dignity, but with your own history, your own social organization, your own competences and capacities. And, and I think it's unimaginable that persons who are such uh, victims should be excluded from any discussion about their fate or their future. And I think this is an imperative question for everybody here, uh, just as a, a norm of social behavior that those affected be included, be consulted. I would also add that it's a, it's a standard of international law in terms of uh, minority rights, uh, part participation and effective participation, and I'll just end it there because the, the standard in international human rights law for persons belonging to my, my minorities under the UN Declaration 1992 uh, on the rights of persons belonging to ethnic or national, uh, religious, or linguistic minorities includes not only the right to exist, Article 1, but also the right to participate. And that participation should be effective. And the notion of effectiveness means in relation to consequences. And as far as I can tell, what you have just said is a violation of all of those norms. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tunkin. Um, and uh, last but certainly not least, our fourth pair, um, Nason Luin, who is a Rohingya activist and blogger, and Saiful Omi, who is a photographer, filmmaker, and activist also working on the Rohingya issue. And they're going to speak about the displacement of the Rohingya worldwide. Thank you. <clears throat> Shall I start? Yeah, please do. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am honored to speak here today. And I want to say a few words uh, about how Rohingya citizenship uh, in Myanmar has been stolen from us by the Burmese government and the military. Our statelessness is not an accident of history. It was deliberately produced by the Myanmar military as a part of ongoing genocide. So after independence of Burma from betraying in 1948, Rohingya were officially recognized as ethnic group of Burma. We enjoy the full citizenship and many Rohingya sub the nation as parliamentarian, even uh, at the rank of minister, many including my grandfather were high-ranking officer. In 1949, when my great-grandfather applied for the citizenship, he received a letter from the Minister of Justice that there was no need, as he belonged to one of the indigenous ethnic group of Burma. So it is incredible to say today contest, but all Rohingya had a national identity card and our citizenship first came under threat about four decades ago. The military government changed the rule and they based the citizenship status 
on ethnic city and the so-called Tayenta national races. So this arbitrary categorization determined who belonged in Myanmar and who did not. This was regardless of how long any group had been living in Myanmar. So if you, are, if you were not in that list, you, are, you were out. So since they don't recognize the Rohingya, uh, uh, since, after, uh, uh, since they, they entered the new citizenship law in 1982, Rohingya were out. So I will continue after the, uh, my <laughs> colleague, uh, <coughs> Mr. Saiful, about the violence and the displacement, uh, the result of the, this uh, statelessness. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, ISI and everybody on the panel. It's been an honor to be here. Um, I came, like most of the time, I come quite unprepared because I feel that I have too many stories to share. Um, so I wanna, I w when I was sitting here at the beginning, I was trying to remem remember the time when we started to work. I started to work for my friend Omol, and he told me something that sort of, yeah, <laughs> with Omol or for Omol. We make the jokes always. Um, I was told that, Omi, get ready for a time when you will work for a diaspora community. The biggest number of Rohingyas now are in Myanmar, which was probably more than 1.2 million then, back in 2008. But we'll come into a point when <clears throat> we will deal with a very large number of the people out of their own country. That has finally happened. It's a shame that I feel inside um, that finding. I was speaking to Radhika and I was asking her the same questions. What is the solution? And she said that the first we need to make sure that six generals goes. When I was sitting here today, and I am sitting here now, I feel deeply ashamed that the power of the six generals are far more than the millions and millions and millions of people around the world. They have done what they wanted to do over the period of many decades, and we have been trying to find a solution in the most civil manner. And we have all been defeated. When we were kids, we used to play football, and we would say, we'll give you a dozen goals. So until now, I feel that we are 10 down, and they have, until now, they have owned. And we must accept that until now, we haven't managed to protect one Rohingya though it's been happening for many decades. So to begin with, I think we must accept that the international community, which includes all of us, have collectively failed to protect the most persecuted community in the world. When I went to Myanmar for the first time, I was very reluctant for many reasons. I have been a target by the Myanmar government. When I produced uh, the film called Hidden Genocide back in 2012, um, we were the first people to use the term genocide in the international media. And Tien Sai then the president issued a press note against me and the director that we have been bribed and all these things, even seven days before the film was shown. And I remember being criticized by many of my friends whom I can see become the biggest spokesman today for using the term genocide. We used it five years ago and now we know that we should have used it maybe 20 years ago. I do feel burdened when I feel that Bangladesh is seen as a key player, with all due respect to Madam. Bangladesh is a key recipient of the problem, key recipient or the biggest recipient of the refugees that we have. You call someone a player when he can play. Bangladesh do not have the capacity. I wish we had, but we don't. For at any level, economic level, the kind of power that we hold at the global politics and all the stages. I think it has been a great conspiracy which has been in action with the help of the Western press, largely the American press and the Western press, to portray Mr. Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi as the savior of the humanity and create a false bubble that once she comes to power, the problem will be solved. And we should all be silent until she gets hold of her power and took over um, the power from the army. Now we see, now we have heard that two of our friends from Reuters would have been freed much before if Aung San Suu Kyi was not opposing it. So the real face of Aung San Suu Kyi is no less 
worse than the face of the army generals. So we have been living in a lie. I have been documenting this for the last 12 years, and I've been documenting this across the world. One of the biggest failure of my country is we have been used as the focus country of the crisis, where we have been, where Saudi Arabia has been hosting almost the equal number of Rohingyas, where they are being resting in Pakistan in hundreds and thousands of people are there. Malaysia has been one of the recipient. We became the victim. Have Bangladesh done and has Bangladesh done enough? I would humbly say no in the past. Have we done enough since 2017? I'm proud that we have done a lot. Should we have done more? Probably. Can we do more? I'm not sure. It's not only about money. It's about a lot of other aspects, the geopolitics in our area and the region. And things are not simple. When you say two major powers in the global power, Russia and China is dead against the whole solution to be at an international level. I wish Bangladesh should have been the key player, but I would humbly remind the international world, international community, and please don't um, think that we can make such a difference. It is you who can. It is us who can help. It is us who is hosting with our very limited capacity. I have been documenting the ideas of stories of displacement. I want to end with a love story that I documented, but before that, I want to tell you that I have the guy who I'm very close to, the man I've been photographing and working with, I have documented his reunion with his mother after 20 years. It happened right in front of my camera. And he, his mother was literally living three kilometers from Bangladesh, and he could almost see his house but they haven't seen each other for 20 years. I have seen this guy speaking to his sister whom he hasn't met for more than a decade and only on Skype. I went to Malaysia and as you know, I'm making a film. And I would like to end this part of my speech with a story that I want to share. I met a couple in Malaysia. I have been very closely working on the trafficking scenario and I'm proud that I'm one of the key person who has uh, worked during the very um, high time of the trafficking scenario. I was reporting from the ground for all the international press. So I knew what happens to women when they are trafficked. And uh, I went to Malaysia and met this couple. The woman is very beautiful. And um, I started to, the way I always work, I stay with people. I tend to spend months with people I photograph. So I started to talk to this guy, then he told me that they were in relationship, they were in love with each other when they were in Myanmar. The guy wanted to come to Malaysia because he wanted to flee. And uh, he came, and later on the question came that if they have to be united, the only way that he can be united with his girlfriend is she being trafficked, or she allows herself to be trafficked. Then she came to Malaysia and, uh, and got married. I found them very happy, and I had to ask, because I'm a journalist, I had to ask, so how did she come? She said, uh, he said, by boat. And then I asked the immediate question, was she safe? And I do remember his eyes, I do remember how sad he was. And he looked at my eyes and said, you know better than I do what happens in the boat. But that is the decision we had to make to be in love and to be in relationship and to get married. Do not ask what happened. I'm sure you are intelligent enough to know what we sacrificed to be together. For me, that is, the, that is the reality of the Rohingyas. To get married, you have to get yourself trafficked and go through what every woman goes through when they um, use the boat to come to a country of the second settlement. Was she raped? The silence told me yes, but I didn't want to go farther because I have documented woman who has been raped by 37 men. And that is the first interview that you'd see in my film, the one that we made. And she actually counted. And after 37, she stopped counting. And I do not know how many people I have interviewed. Thousands and thousands. The last film that I made for National Geographic, I was filming a man who happens to be a Rohingya who was laughing loud about the fact of seeing his own cousin 
jumping off the boat for, the, for a glass of water. He himself was a trafficker. And he was explaining the traumatic experience of being trafficked and how he would go to Thailand and eventually make to Malaysia. I do remember the face of that very young man. Uh, many years ago, I was photographing in Kutupa, uh, near Cox's Bazaar. And uh, the, he was a fisherman. He was, earning, he was earning a lot of money. And I thought he was a happy man. And I asked, so what do you do? What do you, what's your plan for the next few years? A man who was earning far more than most of the Bangladeshis, regular Bangladeshis, he said, I want to go to Malaysia. And I asked, why do you want to go? You are okay here. You are earning enough. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be close to Myanmar. And every time I meet a Rohingya, I feel that they are trying to run away from as far as they can from Myanmar, as if a burning inferno, an invisible inferno is burning their heart. They just want to run away. I also documented people in Malaysia, probably you'll see that in our film, where you see that uh, all the people we interviewed, more than 10, 20 people, the last question to them was, so do you want to go back? All of them said what you said, that I want to go home. Thank you. So, yeah, please, yeah. continue, sorry. Yeah, let me continue about the hundred of thousands of forgotten Rohingya refugees across the world. There are about 300,000 Rohingya refugees in Saudi Arabia, 250,000 in Pakistan, 150,000 in Malaysia, 40,000 in India, 25,000 in United Arab Emirates, a few thousand in Europe, North America, and Australia, and a few hundred in Indonesia. So, India has recently deported more than a dozen. You know, you all know that the genocide is still ongoing in the country. And also, the Indian government is threatening all the refugees. Even half of them are recognized by the UNHCR as a refugee. They are completely unsafe. They always try to deport the, the refugee to Burma or the Bangladesh. I, I'm sure you have read a few stories posted by many media. And in Saudi Arabia, there are about 1,000 or the more than 1,000 are in, in def, indefinite detention. Some of them are as much as for seven years. The crime they have committed is they entered to Saudi Arabia with the fake passport. The fake passport were from Nepal and India, Pakistan, and of course, Bangladesh. Because since uh, after 1982, citizenship law enacted in my country, they stopped issuing the national registration card to the Rohingya. So we became stateless within our own country. So at the time I was very young, but I frequently traveled to Rangoon with my parents. My parents were the civil servant. They had the national registration card, so we didn't have any registration for, for, for my family. But others, you know, they cannot travel. So I think only a few dozen Rohingya had the Burmese passport at the time. Now, they, nobody has. Only the people who are living in Rangoon, they can manage to have the uh, Burmese passport. But the, the Rohingya who are inside, the, who are in Rakhine State, they are living, like, living in the open air prison. So they have only the solution, you know, since there are several restrictions imposed by the military government in 1992. Uh, they have no option. They can only flee to Bangladesh. Then, you know, they, uh, man, uh, the, they manage to have the passport with the human trafficker and the smuggler. And, you know, we have only one country that we consider this is the safe for us. At least we can make some money and we can support our family back in our country. So it is Saudi Arabia. So Saudi, Saudi Arabia has the special uh, rule for the Rohingya uh, not to detain them, you know, whenever they are detained at the immigration checkpoint, 
They release immediately when they can identify them as a Rohingya and they issue their special resident permit. But nowadays the law is changed and since uh, 2011 they have introduced the fingerprint system and these, those people who are uh, in detention for seven years, they were arrested at the various uh, checkpoint and identified as a different nationality. But three countries like Pakistan, India, and the Nepal refused to take them back, but the Bangladesh agreed to take some of them. So they were reported early, uh, deported early this year and some of them, again, you know, they faced the arrest at the Dhaka airport. So I have been working for this uh, story for more than two, two and a half years now. I have sent a lot of letters to the uh, Saudi Arabia foreign ministry and the, their ambassador. And also I have spoke with the European parliament. We still didn't find any solution yet. Those people are forgotten and most, mostly you know, you may not know, but I have spoken with them about, you know, the more than 100 media in the different language, even like, you know, the Al Jazeera, Middle East Eyes, who are critic to the Saudi Arabia. So in the Rohingya, you know, like in Indonesia, at least they are okay, you know, they can at least move here to their, uh, their uh, you know, they are treated as like human being. But those people who are now in detention in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, I still have their audio clip in my phone. This, they always send me the audio clip, you know, how they are suffering. So this is also uh, the result of statelessness within our own country. This is only just one story I am sharing. There are a lot of, so we have the time limit. I think uh, you will have the question. We are ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice <laughs> So I'm going to start taking questions from the back of the room and move forward. But prior to that, I'm actually going to take moderator's privilege and revisit a question that Leticia asked of you, Ambassador, around formal, the possibility of formal education for the more than 450,000 children that are living in the Cox's Bazaar. Well, thank you. Uh, I think in with regard to the question of education, I must uh, flag these things. There are a lot of information gap there because for us, a country like Bangladesh, the priority was to arrange their immediate physical security and also arrange their shelter and other necessities. But as time going, we came to realize that education is maybe now more important than other physical needs. This is why my government, along with different international organizations and local NGOs, they're allowing them to uh, provide uh, educations in the camps. And there are even instances when some of those people in the camps are going to the local schools, but because of some uh, security situations, that thing need, need to be reviewed and being looked at. But the question is that Bangladesh government re really, really feel the necessity of education and allowing NGOs and others to continue their uh, education campaign, but we also need help from others so that we can provide more acute physical, physical needs as well as meeting their education demand. Because we came to see, had they not been in that state of uh, literacy, I think they would have faced these uh, situations far better. Maybe they would have made more uh, I think uh, voices or noises which would have been resonated far uh, farther than what it is now we can hear. So we, we, we are mindful about the education, but we also need to take care of other logistics as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, you on the right, do we have a microphone? Right here. 
And if you don't mind introducing yourself, please. Hi, my name is Khalid Dushan. I'm from Bangladesh. My question is to our honorable ambassador. As we know, uh, the Rohingya kids are not getting the birth certificates. So what is the reason behind this and what is the solution? Do you have any policy to provide the birth certificate to the Rohingya kids in the camps? Thank you. For you, ambassador. Uh, Around birth certificates for Rohingya. Hmm? Birth certificates. Birth certificates in the camp? Uh, I have to regret that uh, sitting over here, I don't have that kind of uh, detailed information from here because uh, this is something I think uh, more at the uh, level of camps and other things. So I'll have to look for it and I think at the recess, please uh, share your contacts. I'll uh, try to provide you an answer afterwards. Thank you. Great. Hi, my name is Leonie, and I was ambas the Dutch ambassador to Bangladesh until last year. Uh, as far as I know, there was some form of certificate given to uh, children that were born. It's not a formal birth certificate because they're not Bangladeshi children, but they did get some form of acknowledgement that they were born there. At least when I left, it was like that. Thank you. Back of the room first. Yes, you left the woman here. Hi, my name is Lindsay Kingston. I'm from the United States. I want to thank, first of all, everyone on the panel for your amazing work and your dedication to this cause. Um, obviously, we're looking at a case of physical genocide. I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. But your comments about the Rohingya culture and history reminds me of how many um, non-physical aspects of this genocide have occurred, more structural violence that has led up to this physical violence. One thing I don't hear about is language policy and education in communities. I was hoping somebody might be able to comment on that, about ways that the Rohingya language has been discriminated against um, in the past and how that's been kind of a tool for repression. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, um, you know, for actually, if you look as a context, you know, when 1962, General Nguyen Power, he stripped up our ethnic right first, and then citizenship rights and imposed restriction of movement, marriage and education, and anti Rohingya campaign and mass uh, atrocities and mass killing. That is how it happened systematically, intentionally destroying us. Uh, we, our language, uh, actually, of course, we have that, and currently, uh, you know, um, in camps, people are using one code and another is also another version. But unfortunately, as a community, you know, as Burmese government is destroying us, we have not managed to get any decision yet. That's what we can see. And especially, I think, um, um, we had, like, 200 years ago, we had our literature and things. Uh, uh, of course, our language was there, but unfortunately, uh, when this genocide, and that is how we always talking about, we have to counteract to rebuild these genocide survivors, empower Rohingya young generation and others. This is counteract to uh, counteract to the Burmese government to reveal these survivors and. As a society, we want to see our future that way. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to add something. Although uh, Burmese government and the military, they do not recognize the Rohingya, but you know, technically, they recognize the, they, until now, technically, they are recognizing the Rohingya language because there are other ethnic groups who are in the list of 135 the so-called they call the uh, national races, the Dainak and the Marmaji in, in Rakhine state, they share our language, they speak the 100% Rohingya dialect, and according to the 1982 citizenship law, you have to speak one of those languages from the 100, uh, 135 ethnic group. So, this dinette 
and the Marmaji, they speak the Rohingya language, but they said this is the Dainal language or the Marmari language, but the same language. But the, they also share the same skin color and the same culture, but our crime is we are Muslim and that they are Buddhist. So they are recognized as a citizen and the indigenous ethnic group, they exclude us based on our religion. Thank you. If I can just add one more comment on that and just broaden this beyond language it's itself. Uh, I think what's really important to acknowledge is the historical long-term structural dis discrimination, exclusion, denial and rejection and undermining of the Rohingya identity, history, etc., which created the, the, the ground, the, the kind of framework within which this could happen. So the fact that the Rohingya are hated by the Rakhine now is because of this systematic messaging and persecution and discrimination of the Burmese military. And this goes to the fact as to why it's so important to stand by the identity and the term Rohingya. Because if we cave in on that, then we are basically accepting the narrative that they are not from Myanmar, they are from Bangladesh, and it's game over then. Thank you, Omar. Yeah, the teacher. Thanks. Just to, to add one more quick point about that, you know, is I was a member of the um, Rakhine Advisory Commission, and, and I, um, I, I, th I think we agreed fully, 100%, with uh, the, the, the right of Rohingya to have their own identity, to celebrate their own language, their cultural festivities, everything. There was just one additional point that we made, because we were trying to find solutions for all in Rakhine State, that an effort had to be made by all, uh, not only the Rohingya, to, sh to make sure that there is a shared language because much of the confusion that occurred and that led to an even greater fear than there really was, was the lack of really good communication. Um, and so, so learning one other language is not only a bird, should not only be asked of the Rohingya, but it should be asked of everyone so that in a very diverse pro pro um, um, st state like Rakhine, communication can be, can, be, um, can be effective. And quite often what happens now, it actually becomes a factor of fear. Very helpful, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's Ian Siderman from the International Commission of Jurists. Um, I'd like to uh, very much thank uh, uh, the the, all the panelists, but uh, particularly the Rohingya colleagues for really um, compelling and moving accounts and analysis. Um, uh, Professor John Packer uh, raised the, rightly raised, I think, the importance of accountability and, um, uh, you know, the, invoking the Genocide Convention and the possibilities before the International Court of Justice. I would be a little bit maybe more um, uh, less pessimistic about the International Criminal Court. It's it's true that uh, that the um, that the remit uh, is is somewhat limited uh, and and it doesn't have full jurisdiction over the the range of crimes. But um, I think the the deterrent effect of even holding a, a single person accountable would would be considerable. Uh, I would also uh, raise the uh, the, the uh, newly established uh, so-called Triple I M, the the independent. Uh, investigative mechanism, which was established by the UN Human Rights Council and is intended to preserve uh, evidence uh, for, for future prosecutions, whether it's by uh, an international court or by, by domestic courts or even hopefully one day within Myanmar itself. Um, I, you, you also mentioned, uh, uh, John, uh, the various forms of reparation that, that are important uh, in this situation. Uh, one, one thing I would add to that is uh, uh, what are called guarantees of non-repetition. Um, and part of that is, is really a serious legal reform inside Myanmar itself. Um, that's obviously not enough and it doesn't change attitudes and practices overnight, but I think having uh, a very serious legal reform is, is very much part of the solution. Um, we just put out a, uh, an analysis of the, of the uh, really racist and appalling citizenship law, the 1982 uh, law that was, uh, that was referenced here. Um, I think that would be 
you know, foremost among the legal reform. And I, I wanted to ask uh, um, uh, the, the colleagues in the panel, especially um, uh, the, our, our Rohingya friends, um, what, how, how significant and how much of a priority uh, is actually changing this, this citizenship law uh, and what are the practical prospects for doing it? Because obviously it's been criticized for, for decades and it, and it remains in place and it, it creates um, you know, various classes of citizens and non-citizens uh, and it's based on, on ethnicity and race. It's, it's completely unacceptable by any measure. Um, but um, should that be the, you know, one of the highest priorities right now in addition to all the other things mentioned? Thank you. Tun Ken, do you want to respond to that? Oh, uh, thanks for the, the comments. So uh, uh, obviously I'm more, uh, I wouldn't say I'm pessimistic, I think I'm realistic uh, about uh, the uh, state, and, and I think we have to be honest to the Rohingya, uh, not only in terms of what the actual recourses that exist, and they are few, uh, might deliver, uh, um, in terms of possibilities and then uh, the likelihood of them. Uh, so it should not be a surprise to anybody in the room here that the International Criminal Court's in trouble. Does anybody think it's really robust and strong? Um, it's, uh, uh, if you look at its docket, uh, I think they have 40 cases. They've succeeded in 20 years in prosecuting 10 people. Um, a number of cases, if you look at the actual implementation, the behavior of countries, member states. I was in Nairobi last week. Should we talk about Kenya? Should we talk about um, uh, Mr. Bashir, uh, his visit to South Africa? Um, you know, we can go on and on, but let's just talk about, so Triple IM, there is no court to bring Triple IM to. I mean, so we have to create one. Who's going to create it? You want to take a bet right now on the chances of establishing a special court right now in the political realities of the world? The ICC, um, look, uh, Myanmar's not a party to the Rome Statute. Consent is a fundamental element of public international law. They don't consent. How many states are going to back the idea that they per pursued? So we have this tiny little sliver of a very creative interpretation where the court has allowed the prosecutor to pursue uh, the deportation element. Now take a look at the crimes. We're talking about statelessness. Uh, whilst the prohibition of statelessness uh, is a violation of international law, it is not a crime. So you're going to have a serious problem prosecuting, and no individual did it. Uh, what are the chances of any repair from any of this? You talk about guarantees, uh, Ian. Sorry, who's going to guarantee any of this realistically? With a prevention? I would like to know what is your evidence that any prosecution internationally has engendered prevention. Uh, let's talk about persons who have been prosecuted and gone back to Yugoslavia to heroes' welcomes. So, I mean, there's a lot of problematical aspects, but in terms of the ICJ and the Genocide Convention, very simple thing. Article 5 of the Convention requires states to, among other things, incorporate the crimes in their domestic law. I don't know if anybody knows, Myanmar's never done it. They've been a party for 65 years. So genocide is not a crime in Myanmar. And the guys who were prosecuted for the, not, for the 10 murders of, uh, uh, um, that the two Reuters uh, um, journalists exposed, uh, they were prosecuted. But by the way, now they've been released and I understand even um, pardoned, they can't be prosecuted again anywhere because of the, of the uh, prohibition in, in, uh, in um, uh, the general prohibition on double jeopardy. So, I, I mean, let's be just very honest and realistic. There's a small community of international criminal law people who are consumed about these things. Look these guys in the eyes and tell them what the real prospects are. I'm, I'm sorry, the prospects are few and small. Uh, and we're not, I didn't mention Russia or China, but we, and we could talk about India, and we could talk about a lot of other countries. What, we could talk about why Netherlands and Canada have not brought cases at the International uh, Court of Justice because it's problematical to interests. So I won't go on, but I would just say, Look, what we do have that is, in this case, remarkable is we have a genocide convention which is very clear on procedures and on scope, and we have 151 states, and unbelievably, Myanmar has accepted the contentious jurisdiction. Wonderful. We don't have to make a court. We don't have to create the standards. And you know, we could bring an application 
any government, Bangladesh is a state party, they could bring an application today on a sheet of paper. So, that, I mean, that's the fact of the matter. And that would cover, and the, the opportunities for reparations, the opportunities for provisional measures. You can't get provisional measures in the ICC uh, in terms of uh, the kind of issues we're talking about. So, and you'll never get reparation in terms of the issues that we're talking about. So let's just be honest. I mean, if, if I can add to that, I mean, the, the beauty of this situation in a way is that we don't have to choose, right? So I think it's really important that those pushing the ICC line continue to do so. But as John says, it, I think it's really important to also pursue the ICJ line. Just one comment on, on the 82 law. So Jose uh, from NRC has been partnering with us uh, and we've been doing a lot of work looking at the 82 law and access to citizenship documentation, etc., in southern Myanmar. So we very intentionally looked in other parts of the country. And it's hugely problematic for a range of people, including those recognized as one of the 135 ethnic groups for a whole host of regions. It's internally contradictory, it's opaque, it's open to arbitrariness, open to corruption, and I can go on. So, I, I mean, yes, the 82 law has to be repealed and reformed, uh, and yes, it has to be done so if Myanmar is serious about this notion of democratization. And we can argue if it is serious or not, but if it is to happen, the 82 law has to be reformed. And I, I think strategically we need to divorce that issue to some extent <coughs> from the Rohingya crisis because it impacts the whole of society, and if we pin it on the Rohingya crisis, there's going to be much greater resistance. Um, excuse me, let me add one line only. This is, the Myanmar government is denying our existence. You know, according to the 82 law, the group has to be into the, in the country since before 1823. We have the primary source evidence that we existed in Burma before the 1823. Arkan, it was Arkan, not Rakhine. You know, they changed the name in 1974. So, um, before, uh, until 1784, Arkan was independent kingdom. Even the, today, like you know, the Rakhine insurgency, Arkan uh, army leader, he accepted our history. We belong there, we have the primary source evidence that was recorded in 1799 by the British medical doctor. So the Burma is, uh, the Myanmar government is denying, the military is denying our existence. That is the problem. If they accept, we can be, you know, they can put us in the, they can extend the 135. They can make it. It was 144 until 1972. Thank you. Let me add one thing. You mentioned about how significant 1982 citizenship law amendment or changes something like how can we move in step forward. Unfortunately, we have not seen political will from Burmese military and the Aung San Suu Kyi's government. Uh, we Rohingya have been supported her for many years. Unfortunately, she is taking side of the military and complicit in genocide against Rohingya. We have seen many things. Where her government is now practicing systematically for our future generation, taking us illegal immigrant by providing national verification card, and we see. This is very dangerous moving forward by the Brahmis military. They are trying to get ASEAN countries. Recently, you have seen ASEAN Thai a foreign minister even, uh, you know, vowing that, oh, uh, Myanmar give them NVC card, they should come back. And I mean, this is very important. We need to look at where, which way they are moving forward. There is unfortunately no willingness. And 19, 1982 citizenship law, there is a chance if international community will to press hard enough to change the law because currently Aung San Suu Kyi's government is leading. But 2020 election coming up next year. So before election, if there, the, this Western wall is supporting her still, for funding, I mean, for the election and these things. So they might take a hook on that to change and to include Rohingyas as a full citizen and others. That's we, but unfortunately, there is so far away the hope. Without international intervention, there is no way to protect 
the Rohingyas of Burma. Thank you. Ambassador. Yes, I just uh, quickly want to add uh, on the uh, ICJ issue. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, in the early 2018 when you hosted, Bangladesh hosted the YC uh, meeting for the foreign ministers. In that one, I think an ad hoc ministerial group was formed to look into the accountability issue. And as a follow-up to that, and it is really very interesting and I think encouraging as well, of all the governments in the world that Gambia took it upon themselves to look into this issue. And on 10 February 2019, they hosted a ministerial, OIC ministerial, a talk committee meeting in Gambia to elaborate on this issue. And they already came up with some specific suggestions, but I cannot say that YC uh, as a body accepted all of those. They are still looking into it. But the fact that they are looking into it, and we are also encouraging them. So I would like to encourage people like you, sir, and others, please let us know, share your insights, so that how we can proceed in that uh, avenue as well. And I think this is something uh, our history taught us, uh, that accountability, accountability, and accountability <coughs> is what we need. And uh, bring an end to this uh, huge chain of impunity. My last comment on this, we are talking about many historical things, my colleagues and others. I think it really, uh, I think, bizarre that we are still debating on whether they are Burmese or not. I would like to flag uh, our uh, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who famously said that uh, Rohingya did not come to Burma. Burma came to Rohingya. <laughs> Please keep in mind. Just quickly, very quick point on the, um, on the 1982 law. Um, it's a useless law, not only for the Rohingya, but for the entire country. And it's, we have to be prepared to commit to a longer term project because it lies at the, at the heart of a lot of things that are wrong in, 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 in Myanmar. Uh, for the short term, I think you should look at what many people, including UNHCR, have concluded uh, a while back, a couple of years ago, that the law was misinterpreted when it started to be applied in, by 1986 or so, when they started to do that. It's easier to say, you misapplied it, what can you do about it for the short term, while at the same time, um, uh, looking at the longer term, and I would like to point to, to Ian over there, who's with the ICJ, the other ICJ, the International Commission of Jurists, who have earlier this week on Monday in Yangon uh, launched a, 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 a new legal brief which doesn't focus just on the Rohingya because many people in Myanmar don't want to touch the law because it's poisoned because of the Rohingya issue. But that looks clearly at why it is bad for all of Myanmar. And it starts with, and then I'll stop, that the, the, the 2014 census showed that 25% of all people in Myanmar are undocumented. So that's, that's where the problem starts. That's a longer term issue, but let's focus on the short term possibility of pushing Myanmar to look at the, the, the wrongful application. So, five more minutes, over time? Okay, okay, Jose, I promised you first, and then I'm gonna go back to you because you've been looking at me for an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Jose from Norwegian Refugee Council in, in Myanmar. And I was very happy to hear from uh, John Packer uh, the word restitution. And um, what I will say is um, that maybe we need to think of policy measures or political, political approaches to make sure that things don't get worse uh, in the meantime. Because, for example, we have the 2012 vacant follow and virgin land management law in place, which was also recently amended, and uh, which basically allows the government to take over the land of displaced persons, to put it in, in simple words. And um, there is a strong civil society movement now in Myanmar calling for the suspension of the application of this law. 
or for other measures that will prevent IDPs not only from Rakhine and, and refugees, but also Kachin, uh, Northern Shan, and IDPs from the Southeast and refugees that are now in, in Thailand. So these are, this can be a common cause that is not only focusing on, on one ethnic group, but on, on the people of Myanmar no? and, and their rights. And for me, the question which will go to Leticia, I guess, is, uh, you know, in the Rakhine Advisory Commission report, there were several mentions to land and to property rights, and there was a call for return to place of origin in line with international standards. But now the, the Rakhine Commission is, is over. The government made a commitment to implement these recommendations, but not much happened. So what is the, what is the next step? What, what can we do with this uh, report that was so well prepared? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the Rakhine Advisory Commission, Commission ceased to exist after it's uh, handed over its report. Uh, the, uh, the government says it is monitoring implementation, but it is not. It is putting out some PR pieces every now and then which suggests that they're very active and everything is under control. Um, in reality, that's not the case. And I think what's very important is that a big push is made to, 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 uh, uh, you know, to make sure that the government allows serious independent monitoring of the, of the implementation of the recommendations. They will be, you know, they will, that is not, will not be easily achieved but it hasn't been done. Everyone sort of accepts every time another nice piece of PR comes along and they sit there and say nothing. But I think that if at the level of the UN uh, um, General Assembly, which also mentions every time it passes a resolution, that report and its recommendations, um, this particular issue should be, should be taken up. Uh, there is um, a report that was done by a group of um, NGOs. They looked at 40 of the 88 recommendations. Um, I cannot name the groups that, that did that because this is the problem if you are in Myanmar and you're working on these kinds of issues because you want them, the outcome to inform your own work, you have to be very secretive about it and not share it publicly. And I think what, this is something that INGOs and also the UN and others and bilaterals who are working there should consider when are you at risk of becoming complicit by keeping in place what is basically an apartheid state, strictly enforced ethnic segregation? How long can you do serious research, and very good research, by the way, and not making it public because that might risk your operations uh, in the country? The UN is starting to look at that issue now, and the... the, the the, the United Nations uh, resident coordinator just two weeks ago uh, wrote a letter to the government in which he said, look, you know, this whole idea of closing uh, all the, uh, the, 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 the dilapidated camps from 2012 uh, is a good idea, but what you're doing instead, you're creating new camps where exactly the same conditions will prevail, nothing will change, and we find it difficult under those circumstances to continue to cooperate with you. Luckily, that letter, letter leaked, and it's now the first time, and it's important because I hope others will follow, the first time that an organization has spoken out and said, stop, you know, uh, you, you, you're, making me, you're trying to make me complicit to your crimes. I want to give Hafsar the last word. I would like to say that we acknowledge and appreciate individuals, organizations, and every human beings who have been making effort and contributing for our cause and who have made these events happen today. And it makes us believe that humanity still exists and we are not alone. Thank you for standing by our side. And during or after this conference, if there is any realistic, approachable, short-term or long-term strategies may come up as the oppress we are more than happy to be any possible part within our capacity and abilities we are in. Thank you so much. Let's thank the incredible panelists.